this talk's been distilled down um, from a longer talk. Uh, and you can, if anyone wants to find out more information, kind of I speak more at length, um, there's a link uh, here, and that's to uh, Trees for Life YouTube, um, where we've got a, a longer version. Um, but I have got some uh, extra little bits and pieces in here. Uh, so yeah, um, I guess I'll get started. Uh, so this presentation is uh, just to give some people a flavour of some of the things that we found during the Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project. Um, and this has been a three-year project, really, that um, started back in March 2018. Uh, and it's kind of the main part of it's wrapped up now, although uh, in a kind of different form now, I'm, I'm currently surveying Forest and Land Scotland sites. Um, so some of the information for those sites is not, is not in here yet. Um, but the, the format of this presentation is just a brief uh, background to Caledonian Pinewood um, and a brief description of some of the uh, ways that we conceptualized Caledonian Pinewood health and resilience, and then just try to get stuck into the results for the bulk of it. Um, but yeah, there's more of the background on the, on the uh, talk here. Um, so first of all, uh, Caledonian Pinewoods are basically sites where groups of wild Scots pine still survive in Scotland. Um, that's, that's really the core of them. It, it's wild Scots pine that have naturally regenerated uh, from the populations that originally recolonised Scotland after the last ice age. And wild Scots pine can be in all kinds of fantastical shapes, like this pine here um, at Glenfeshi. Um, like really, really variable, not your kind of um, typical sort of uh, straight plantations of pine, uh, but really um, Parkdorfle trees, a lot of them are very individual. Uh, Caledonian pine woods are also home to some of our really iconic wildlife species like this capercaillie uh, and loads of other things as well that are less iconic but equally as important. There are 84 Caledonian pine wood sites that are officially recognised on what's called the Caledonian pine wood inventory um, and they're scattered across the, the highlands of Scotland. Um, there are other sites as well that we're aware of that aren't included in this inventory, um, but the, the project, the Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project has focused on these 84 sites and so far 58 of those sites have been surveyed and that's the, uh, the data that some of the findings that are presented here are from those sites. Uh, so just a little bit of background about the project, Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project, as I said, started back in March 2018. Uh, it had three objectives. Um, the first was really to better understand Pinewood health and resilience, to improve the relationships between stakeholders, and to bring more uh, Caledonian Pinewoods into active management. Um, my part of the project has really been this first bit here to try and better understand Pinewood health and resilience. So my job really has been to survey sites for health and resilience and then write up reports for land managers. And my colleague Fiona uh, has really been working on the, um, the relationship side of things and uh, kind of delivering those reports to land managers um, and seeing if we can get uptake of, of more active measures on some of these sites. So I'm going to just focus on this top one here uh, about Caledonian Pinewood health and resilience. Um, in terms of what it means for a Pinewood to be healthy and resilient, um, these are things that are uh, up for debate. Um, for the purposes of this project, I basically went and looked at the literature and done some thinking myself about, you know, what, what is it that really makes a Pinewood healthy and resilience, resilient? And I guess the first thing is to try and define these terms. So to, to me, a healthy Caledonian Pinewood is one that can support all of the different wildlife you might expect to see there uh, in the abundances that it can do. So it kind of meets its potential. Um, and a resilient Pinewood is one that can recover after a big disturbance event or can maintain itself in the face of stressors. Um, and so what the way we conceptualize this was really that there are four characteristics that healthy and resilient pine woods tend to have. The first of these is diversity. Uh, and I'll come on to this in a little bit more detail in the next slide, but diversity is really about, is that pine wood good habitat for the full range of things that you might expect to be able to live there? Um, and uh, and, and diversity is also important for, um, for resilience because if you have more uh, kinds of, of native trees growing there, 
if one were to be knocked out by disease, for example, um, then at least you still got something there to carry on that woodland. Whereas if you just had one tree species, um, the whole site could be lost. The second characteristic is continuity. And that's really the ability of uh, the pine wood to regenerate all of those diversity components within it. The third is mobility, which is about whether or not that pine wood is free to move around in the landscape, which is particularly important today in our kind of changing climate context, where the areas where certain woodland types might be in the landscape in the future um, could change. And so mobility is key to, to being able to make that adjustment. And connectivity, is it big and joined up? Sites that are bigger are able to hold more diversity within them, uh, but also sites that are bigger and more joined up are better able to recover from disturbances because uh, species can recolonize from pockets that survive. So for example, if, a, if a, a massive storm came through and blew down lots of the trees in the pine wood, well, if it was a, a big joined up pine wood, the species that might be lost after that storm can recolonize uh, from the connected areas, whereas if it was isolated, it couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And then, right. and then within uh, this context, so we have these characteristics of health and resilience. We also have the things that influence them, um, and so some of some of the things that influence uh, health and resilience include um, large herbivore impacts, uh, so grazing, browsing, damage to trees, um, non-native species, disease. Climate change, fire is a huge factor in pine woods as well, and fragmentation. Um, and so really what I then had to do whenever, whenever this kind of concept bit was done, I uh, had to go away and come up with a kind of survey method to actually assess this in the field. And so what was settled on was a mainly plot-based survey. Um, so within half acre plots, we were capturing lots of information about the different trees and shrubs present, the different growth stages of them, their contribution to canopy and undergrowth, uh, any kind of older veteran features on trees. Um, we had different kinds of dead wood, how accessible the, the trees were, um, herbivore impacts by species. We also looked at some of the ground vegetation as well and um, the, the impacts on them, um, as well as things like uh, the height of flammable vegetation, uh, ground disturbance, um, burning, et cetera, et cetera. So we were capturing lots of information within these plots. And then the idea really was to take that information and analyze it in a way that gave us clues about the health and resilience of the sites. Um, so I'm gonna now go in and try and cover as best I can in a short period of time, uh, some of the results that we've got. Um, but again, this is really just a flavor, like there's been quite a lot that we've um, we found appear to have a connection issue with James just now. He's dropped out of the chat, so we'll uh, we'll see if we can get him back in and get going again. Hi, James, got you back now. Just sent you the button there to unmute. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Sam. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, really bad Wi-Fi connection. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I was just saying, uh, so we've, um, we've, got our, we've got our survey sheet, uh, went out and looked at sites. We've got 100 and, or 865 plots. So, uh, the first thing was uh, looking at diversity. Is it good habitat? Um, so there's lots of different components of a pine wood that can make it uh, kind of good habitat for certain groups of species. Um, so one of these is the, the living trees and shrubs themselves. Um, 
Another is the surfaces of the trees for lichens and, uh, and bryophytes. Um, we have old and veteran trees too. There's a whole suite of specialist pinewood species associated with those. Dead trees and shrubs, uh, different kinds of dead trees and shrubs support different suites of associated species. Uh, so standing dead pines that have lost their bark can support specialist lichens, whereas fallen dead pines can support specialist bryophytes. <clears throat> We've got the ground vegetation uh, and there's specialization at that level as well, where certain uh, species are relying on, on different uh, wildflowers. We have the actual structure of the wood itself in terms of the cover and the layers. Uh, which is really important for lots of things. And we have flowering and fruiting. Um, so uh, plants that produce insect pollinated flowers are really important for certain uh, insects. Um, plants that fruit uh, are very important for a lot of the animals that live in pine woods, especially going into the winter time. And finally, wood ant nests are a key diversity feature as well, um, because lots of things live inside the, the, the wood ant nests themselves and the wood ants perform an important function in the pine woods. So these were some of the components of diversity that were looked at uh, during the project. Um, and one of the things that, that we find is that, you know, really none of these, none of the pine woods are, are kind of meeting all of, you know, they don't have all of the maximum diversity they could have here in terms of support in the full range of, of wildlife. Um, it, it's kind of more fragmented between sites. Some sites have lots of old trees. Uh, some sites are mainly young trees, but there's um, there's really nice ground vegetation. You know, there's kind of a real mix of things going on. Um, and the reason why some of these things are limited at the minute, like old and veteran trees, it's really a legacy of, of past management. Um, and uh, a really interesting result um, in terms of the living native trees and shrubs is, is uh, a lot of the diversity is being suppressed at the early growth stages. So there's there's a greater richness of species at the early growth stages where those are present than there are uh, in the later growth stages. Um, and I'll come on to that a little bit in a minute. Uh, flowering and fruiting is hindered by grazing pressure a lot of the time. Um, a lot of these things like different tree surfaces and, and cover and layers and dead trees and shrubs, ultimately these depend on the, the living native trees and shrubs and there being a diversity of those present. Um, although some of the dead trees and shrubs are generated by specific events like fire, for example. So yeah, so there's those factors as well. Uh, but just on this point of the living native trees and shrubs, um, the richness being greater in the earlier growth stages, if we look at some of the results here, so this is showing the species richness of trees and shrubs at different growth stages. Um, and the, the height of the column is the, the kind of total. So the seedlings and saplings are the most species rich in total, but the red and the orange, the red is, is showing uh, trees and shrubs that are stunted by heavy browsing at those early growth stages and are unable at present to actually maintain new growth and continue to, to grow on to maturity. Um, so this, this issue of selective over browsing, as I call it, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, is a big issue in Pinewoods constraining diversity. In, in the past, people have talked about whether we should carry out enrichment planting to introduce species back in. What I find is that actually in a lot of uh, Pinewoods, there are lots of species there. They're just stuck at that early growth stage by the, the heavy selective browsing pressure. Moving on to continuity, uh, this is really about the ability of all of those structures in the wood to, to regenerate themselves. Uh, but obviously key to this are the trees themselves. Um, and so here we can see we've got a, a deer fence uh, and on one side we have really good continuity where we have lots of young trees as well as old ones. Whereas on the other, we have old and dead trees that are not replacing themselves. Um, and what we found was that Scots pines threatened with complete loss in about 13% of plots. Uh, and what that means is that the canopy cover is already low and the only Scots pines that are left are either stunted at the early growth stages, uh, are mature, old or dead. Um, so those are the ones where Scots pines pretty threatened at the minute. It's not replacing itself. Um, and it's retreating in another 7%. So what that means is that the only regeneration or the only early growth stages are found 
in inaccessible micro sites on the plot. So maybe the side of a ravine or on a cliff. If we look at the cover of Scott's Pine instead, cover of Scott's Pine is decreasing significantly in 24% of plots uh, versus increasing a lot in 18%. So we see really that there's, there's a, a very variable picture in the pine woods. And this varies not just between sites where some sites are, are regenerating well and others aren't. It also varies within sites. Um, and I'll come on to that in a moment as well, but it has a lot to do with, with um, fencing management. In terms of mobility, is a pine wood free to move around in the landscape? We know in the past, pine woods were able to move around after the last ice age, whenever the glaciers retreated, Pine was able to recolonize the highlands, uh, so it had good mobility then. Good mobility today is really crucial with current climate change to allow trees to track changes in their climatic envelopes. Um, and, and so here we can see old pines in the distance and naturally regenerated pines all the way back here. Uh, so good mobility like this was present in 23% of plots, um, and I should say th those are plots in the regeneration area around the pine woods in areas that are predicted by the native woodland model to be suitable for Scots pine growth. Uh, and finally, connectivity. Is it big and joined up? Uh, so we've got some sites that are really huge, like Glen Affric here, uh, where we've got pine joined right the way from the, the distance here to the pines in the foreground. Um, but actually only 10% of sites are greater than 500 hectares in size, which is the kind of size threshold to be able to support the maximum level of diversity. So Capra Cayley, for example, are, are more often found in woods that are over 500 hectares in size. That's thought to be uh, linked to the viability of their populations. So only 10% of our pine woods are able to, uh, to provide that kind of habitat in the first place. Um, and we have some sites that are very small, a couple of hectares or less. Uh, what I also found was that um, Scots pine being the commercial species in uh, kind of D-side and Speyside uh, provides connectivity between some of these ancient Caledonian pine woods. Um, so these are our planted pine forests, uh, but elsewhere uh, Sitka spruce is really the main commercial forest species and so it doesn't provide the same level of connectivity. Uh, but I should say that connectivity operates on a species by species basis. And if we think of those different habitat components I talked about in diversity, you know, in a, in a commercial pine plantation, you might have good ground vegetation and you might have good cover and layers, but you won't have necessarily the different kinds of deadwood and you won't necessarily have any old trees within that. So it can provide connectivity for certain things and not others, which is worth bearing in mind. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you a picture of connectivity so this is, this is our Caledonian Pinewood inventory site in darker blue. And our uh, additional native pinewood from the Native Woodland Survey Scotland in light blue. So this is in, uh, in the Cairngorms, a landscape where you can see how, how it's um, pretty well connected by some of these commercial pine forests. And the, the pinewoods themselves are well connected anyway. The scale here is not to eight kilometers. This is, in the southwest of Scotland, um, as a cluster of pinewood sites, the same scale, but you see how much more fragmented this is. Um, and th there really isn't that level of connectivity. Like it's a massive contrast between different parts of the country as to how well um, sites are joined up. So the Cairngorms connectivity is probably the best there. And it's really, really poor in the southwest and parts of the northwest as well. So why are our pinewoods not doing better? Um, herbivore impacts are high or very high in 63% of plots. So within each of the plots I did, I did a herbivore impact assessment. Um, and so those were, the, the results were determined as high or very high in 63%. And the main large herbivores present are deer, which were found at all sites, uh, mostly red deer, um, but quite a lot of roe deer as well, um, followed by sheep found at 22% of sites, but the deer are really the overriding large herbivore. Um, most sites no longer have livestock grazing. And in that context, what we see is lots of deer fencing. 19% uh, of Caledonian pine wood that I've visited is now enclosed. Um, and because of that, a lot of the sites have their management compartmentalized. So we can see here in this picture how part of the site is within a deer fence and part of the site is outside. 
this is a very uh, frequent thing now where um, there might be in some sites two, three, four, even more deer fence compartments and also parts of the site outside deer fences completely. There's very few sites that are fully fenced. So the management's become quite um, different within different compartments. Uh, and what we see inside effective deer fences is that regeneration increases, tree species richness generally increases, and mobility increases as well. We also see inside effective deer fences recovery in the ground vegetation. So this is inside versus outside the fence. We can see the, the recovery of the dwarf shrubs. Blaberries come back in here after 12 years. Um, we've got blaberry and cowberry again, whereas outside we've got Nardus um, and Millennia. However, uh, signs of deer. So, so this is inside this deer fence. We can see there's a track along the inside. This is a really common thing. Uh, signs of deer were found inside 78% of the deer fences and herbivore impacts were higher, very high in 55% of fence plots. So deer fences are not uh, necessarily keeping deer out as we might expect them to. And actually the impacts inside some of them are, are pretty high. And what we often find in that situation, uh, because deer fences have given a temporary reprieve in terms of pressure, you start to see regeneration take place of multiple species. But whenever the deer get in, the deer are, are naturally selective browsers and they are pretty choosy about what they'll eat if they have that choice. Uh, so here we can see a picture of a, a Scots pine sapling and a birch sapling beside it. The birch is completely stunted by the level of browsing. You can see how it's like multiple branches um, in response to that heavy browsing pressure, but it can't go anywhere. It's not putting on uh, vertical growth, whereas the pine's just fine. <laughs> Like right beside it, the deer are choosing to eat this birch tree, but not the pine. Um, and what that means over time, presumably, is that, you know, that goes on to impact the diversity in the canopy and of the later growth stages. Um, so this, this problem is what I call selective overbrowsing, and it's a big issue inside deer fences. More of an issue inside deer fences and outside them, just partly because there's more regeneration there to begin with. And actually, uh, at some sites in the southwest of Scotland, we see this really interesting pattern where um, it's the Scots pine itself that is selectively browsed out of these pine woods outside the deer fences or inside deer fences where deer get in, when deer get in. So this is a picture here from a site where it, this is an effective deer fence inside, and this is going down to a lock. So the deer were kind of partially cut off by the fence. And outside, so outside the fence, they browsed out the young pine, whereas inside we've got nice mixed regeneration of birch and pine together. So you can see how that selective over browsing um, can lower the diversity and it can actually eliminate Scots pine itself from the regeneration cohort in some places. This is a pattern that we see mainly in the southwest highlands for whatever reason. We also see some examples of landscape scale deer management without fences. Um, and at these sites, uh, diversity, continuity, mobility and connectivity is generally improving where the landscape skilled deer management is at a really sufficient level. Um, there's, there's, some, there's a few sites where landscape skilled deer management is taking place and deer fences are being used. And what that tends to imply to me is that if you're still having to use deer fences, your deer management is in, um, it's, it's not achieving that level of diversity and continuity and mobility and connectivity that you might want ecologically. Moving on from herbivore impacts, uh, oh, uh, just a little note to say, um, where there's landscape scale deer management, you also tend to get recovery of other uh, kinds of vegetation. So this is um, uh, Monty and Scrub. We see dwarf birch here now mixed with young pine and young downy birch. Um, so yeah, it's nice to see the sort of uh, some of these ecotone habitats starting to re-establish again on the edge of pine woods. Moving on to non-native species, uh, these were found in 20% of plots, but they're mostly scattered in young at the moment. Um, so the vast majority of non-native species are their early growth stages, uh, but this is a bit of a ticking time bomb because if, if they're not effectively removed, uh, they're going to the impacts from them are going to become much greater as they mature and then uh, start to shade out vegetation, compete for space, um, and and reseed themselves. 
Uh, and I, I came across sites where there's really good management of non-native species taking place, like this rhododendron clearance, although there's always follow-up required. Um, and, and this was something that was uh, a bit of a pattern as well. There's a lot of the time where the, the management has happened to remove the mature stands, but we're still seeing regeneration, so there's follow-up required. Moving on to fire, we have evidence of so evidence of past fire, that, by that I mean like um, fire scarring on trees. Um, I found that at 41% of the sites I visited. So fire has been a huge uh, uh, shaping force of these pine woods, at least in the past. Recent burning was recorded at 28% of sites, although it's usually only in small areas. But the really damaging thing for pine woods is fire combined with high herbivore impacts. So if you think about your pine wood, if a fire goes through um, and, and if it does become a canopy fire and kills a lot of the trees, that in itself, as long as it's not a repeated thing um, too frequently, uh, can, be quite a, can be quite a neutral thing for the, the wood itself if the regeneration then follows. But the problem is where fire happens repeatedly or where fire happens followed by high herbivore impacts that suppress any regen, and that's where you just get loss of the wood itself. And, and there are significant areas of Caledonian pine wood that have been completely lost to that combination of fire and high herbivore impact. Uh, climate change is really tied to mobility. So here we can see the little trees marching up the hill. Um, the ability of pine woods to adapt to climate change is going to depend uh, move into higher elevations or into lower elevations where there's cold air pooling um, or microclimatic effects that favor uh, continuity of the, the habitat type. Um, mobility is really key. It's generally insufficient, except where landscape skill deer management is underway. Even if you have a fence, the mobility can only take you to the edge of the fence normally. So it, it's much better if you've got that landscape skill management to allow the habitat to properly expand um, to wherever suitable for it. Uh, disease is currently not um, a huge issue in Caledonian pine woods. You know, I've come across some juniper phytophthora, like um, these dead bits here. Uh, but by and large, um, disease doesn't seem to be a major problem at the moment. Uh, there's Dothostroma risk to Scots pine uh, from lodgepole pine potentially. Um, but this is there's been a lot of lodgepole removal actually, although there's often follow up work required. Uh, so yeah, low exposure at present. Uh, although the resilience is actually relatively low because of that selective overbrowsing, which is constraining the diversity of living trees and shrubs in the pine woods. Uh, and finally, uh, fragmentation. So this is um, this is an area that was described by Timothy Punt, who was a, a 16th century cartographer, as a mighty park of nature. Um, there were multiple pine woods in this area at that time. Uh, now there's only a, a handful of tiny fragments, including this one here, which is undocumented. Um, and uh, the nearest site, something like, you know, it's a good few kilometers away. Uh, fragmentation's had a huge impact on, on pine woods over the last few centuries. Um, some of the sites that Punt wrote about no longer exist around uh, Glen Coe, for example. Um, and yeah, and, and a lot of the time, um, pine woods that did have been reduced tiny fragments in ravines. Hmm. And you can actually see at this site here where we've had, a, we have a full pine wood still here, like all the stumps are there. Um, and these aren't stumps that have been exposed from, you know, thousands of years ago from the peat. Like these are recent stumps, relatively recent. Uh, and you can still see a few trees hanging on here. So yeah, in, in terms of change, um, one of the things I was able to do was look at, uh, so obviously we have a good history of looking at our pine woods. Um, Stephen and Carlisle wrote the native pine woods of Scotland in the fifties. Um, so I was able to look at some of the descriptions they've provided and compare it to what I saw in the field. And in general, there have been some areas of old woodland lost to commercial forestry and fire. So those were um, a forest with non-native species uh, or burnt. There's now less livestock um, and a lot more deer fencing than there was back then management has become more compartmentalized. There's generally more regeneration and there's been some conversion of these, um, of these Caledonian pine woods, which are made up of wild trees into plantations of native species. Uh, so some of our pine woods have had areas of them planted out, um, which is yeah, generally sort of thought to be inappropriate for these sites that are refuges for wild trees. 
uh, I find some regional issues um, whenever I was looking at sites. Uh, the sites in the southwest have the poorest continuity and mobility. They've got poor connectivity. Uh, the selective browsing of Scots Pine is taking place in a lot of them. Uh, management's heavily reliant on compartmentalised fencing rather than landscape scale um, herbivore management. So this might be an area that um, people might want to think about prioritising in the future. So I probably ran over the time by now, uh, just to um, quickly give a little bit of the big picture of things, uh, bring things together. Uh, management of pine woods is widespread but compartmentalised. A lot of sites do have fences across part of the site. Um, so people are trying to do things, but it's just not at a sufficient scale to really um, to allow our woodlands to be actually healthy and resilient. So health and resilience is uh, improving locally, but it, um, and the management is improving that, but it's not always effect as effective as we might expect because of things like selective overbrowsing whenever deer get inside fences. Um, so yeah, so we need to think about how we either monitor herbivore impacts inside fences for a longer time, um, and what the what the end goal is with fencing. Is it just to release the fence again and allow very high herbivore impacts to resume at the end of that lifespan? Um, or do we want to move towards that landscape scale deer management? Many areas are still declining. Sites in the Southwest generally need the most help. However, there are now some exemplary sites, mostly around the Cairngorms, although we also have um, examples in the Northwest too. Uh, sufficient landscape scale deer management is often key. Um, so I think the real kind of concluding uh, sentence is, yeah, we still have a way to go until we have healthy and resilient pine woods. But people are, there is work going on in the ground. Um, so yeah, that's me. I've, I've talked plenty. If anyone wants to fire any questions, um, please do. I'm happy to take those now. We've got three questions there um, in the chat that I could uh, start reeling off. Uh, James, thanks very much for the that was fascinating. Uh, we've got one from Graham Jill here. Uh, I might just request to unmute in case uh, they want to expand on the question. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just interested to know whether you had made comparisons with previous surveys. You mentioned them um, comparing with Stephen and Carlisle, and, uh, but I think there's been lots of other surveys in the past um, of pine woods. I remember doing some myself in the 1970s and uh, just wondered if you'd been able to do comparisons with these to see how woods have changed. Yeah, thanks very much, Graham. Um, I only compared to Stephen and Carlisle uh, and, and part of the reason for that was because the, the way we gathered our data, we didn't um, reuse an old survey method for it. Uh, and we weren't locating the plots in the same places necessarily. Um, so we didn't, we didn't do direct comparisons there, but um, I know that the Bunce survey that was done, um, I think that was maybe in the seventies, those plots are being redone now. Um, and so there will be comparisons between that and, and they're being redone in the same way. So it wasn't thought to be, uh, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't bother trying to um, spend too much time looking at the, the Bunce data to try and compare because, um, because that's already being done separately. Um, although there were some of the sites that I looked at, uh, the Bunce data for didn't um, quantitatively uh, do anything with it, but um, notice that there are some of those sites that they looked at then that are now uh, conifer plantations, for example. Um, so there are some sites that have been uh, where, there, where there's very clear changes there, but other changes, I guess, will come out of that piece of work that's being done. Okay, that'd be really interesting. Thanks. I'm just reading um, a question from Malcolm. Um, should the riparian network be emphasized as being particularly important for connectivity? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I think whenever I was looking at connectivity, I was looking at uh, Caledonian pine woods and then um, native pine wood as the main connecting habitat. Um, and of course, that's not always the case. Like uh, riparian woodlands, which tend to be um, different woodland types, pine's not a kind of usual riparian species. Um, except in the kind of um, very high up areas. Um, there will be connectivity for some of the species that are living in the pine woods of other woodland types, but that's something that wasn't widely looked at during the, the survey. Um, 
but yeah, uh, that will be that will be uh, something really. Yeah, it will be interesting to look at, and it will be interesting to see what degree of connectivity uh, riparian woodlands can actually provide for a lot of pine wood species. Thanks, James. Yeah, um, take take your point on that. Um, yeah, um, in places the uh, the absence of pine, I suppose, in the riparian zone is is um, you know important. Uh, but I was it sort of struck me um, like an aside really that where you have pine woods that are probably in tension with uh, productive native pine woods that you you also included in in your survey. Um, the, the importance of the riparian network work might might well be worth um, emphasizing as the permanent structure for the pine wood landscape, if you like. And if if nothing else, there is that connection conserved uh, that links pine wood areas as as such. Uh, even if you know the, the bulk of part of them has become more um, more commercial. In, in its nature, you know? So uh, yeah, it's just a thought. Thank you. Mm, yeah, no, thanks very much. And I mean, in some of these areas, particularly in the West of Scotland, it is actually um, the, the steep sides of ravines where pine has retreated to. And so those areas are really important uh, for, for pine itself, <laughs> Never mind connectivity, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. And I think, uh, I think ideally, you know, if, if we could, um, if we were able to move towards more kind of uh, sufficient landscape scale deer management, connectivity for pine is gonna just uh, spill out into the landscape. You know, whenever you have a landscape that's kind of friendly towards tree regeneration versus one that's hostile to it, um, you get massive improvements in connectivity and all the little fragments just link themselves up by themselves. Um, so I think that would be, that would be really the ideal um, scenario, but uh, in in the current context of what we have at the moment, yeah, um, I can see why the the riparian network could be um, quite important. Um, I've got a question from Ian, which is, um, did I ever find the perfect pine wood? Um, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a tr it's a tricky question. All of the pine woods are incredible like they are they're all really special in their own in their own way and they are all individualistic based on you know how they've been managed in the past um although that doesn't necessarily align with what we're looking for in terms of health and resilience um in terms of providing that really good habitat and in terms of um being able to withstand some of the changes that we know are coming further down the line um i didn't find a perfect pine wood in terms of uh what we might expect a really healthy resilient one to look like um, I mean, you, you can find fragments of them. You can find fragments of, of really rich uh, pine wood with lots of different tree species and old trees and stuff in some of these really inaccessible areas where there's like, um, you know, a, a little ravine, but then you're not really, uh, in, in those bits, you're not meeting the kind of need for connectivity as well, you know, and for the, the pine wood to be of the right scale. So even if you find a, a fragment of pine wood, which is really rich and it, it has a lot of the key species there, um, very often those areas are very restricted. And so you're not, you're not, it's not at the scale where it can support all the, the wildlife um, that you might like. So yeah, no, no, no perfect pine wood, unfortunately. Um, can, I just add to my, can I just add to my question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'd like to think I probably have seen some inside fences but my thoughts slightly have gone on a little bit since somebody raised an issue, I think it was Alistair, about the future of them. I'm actually involved in some really old woodland grant schemes of 25 years plus that have produced good pine woodlands, but now um, the owners are looking to take the fences down and let the deer back in. And I think that's a really important issue uh, for the future and what quality of woodlands will remain on site, if at all, if the deer numbers are brought back up again. I mean, the deer numbers may be controlled inside the old fenced areas, but I think that's mm. a really important issue. All right, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a huge issue. And I think that um, what I often see inside deer fences, you, you can tell whenever the deer have recently got back in because, you know, you still have quite tall blaberry, but it's being absolutely hammered. You know, it's being, it's being very heavily browsed. So that's actually, you know, the height's often reducing from it. You know, any of the honeysuckle that had started to go up is now back on the ground again, suppressed. Um, 
the because very often you, you I think the problem at the moment is that you're not really getting this transition from no herbivore impact to kind of low or medium it's going straight from low to high or very high and in that context so much of the stuff is being really knocked back um and and you know whenever you look at the let's see if i can go back to the presentation boop, 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 boop. um yeah whenever you look at uh whenever you look at fences like this where you start to see the blaberry and stuff coming back it's not just the trees it's also all of that brown vegetation the flowering and fruiting species which are the flowering and fruiting species are disproportionately very palatable to deer and so that they often get suppressed more so if you think about you know you've got blaberry which is very tasty to deer um you've got bramble which is very tasty to deer honeysuckle ivy uh dog rose um all of these species produce insect pollinated flowers and berries whereas a lot of the unpalatable species like for example millennia um is not producing those things and so the habitat quality goes way down whenever you start to have really high impacts again so i think where fences are coming down um the objective really has to be to look at the surrounding impacts in the, in the surrounding landscape and bring those down to a level that is compatible with this vegetation you know still being in recovery um and i think this idea that we can have even 20 years without deer and then we just go back to high or very high um yeah you're not the key to resilience is that regeneration has to be able to take place following any disturbance event if you have a fire that comes through your pine wood your pine wood might have had 20 years of recovery but once the fire comes through and kills some of those young trees again then you're you know if you can't have further regeneration after that you're back to square one so like regeneration has to always be possible really for resilience um it doesn't have to always be happening you know you might have um there might be reasons why regeneration isn't coming up as you might expect it to but following a disturbance event it has to be able to take place for there to be resilience um so yeah so i guess that's uh all, all of that to me says that we we can't really have healthy and resilient pine woods in a context of um these background levels of of herbivore impacts being high or very high um, so yeah in terms of fences coming down uh it, it's then starting to look at the landscape and, and landscape scale herbivore impacts and, and starting to try and reduce those or else if that's not possible try to renew the fence um i guess that's that's what my uh take on that would be uh, and there's also a need for more monitoring within fences for a longer time like the regeneration of pine is really really slow in some of the sites in the northwest in 30 years you might be getting pine that's still chest height um and it, it's it's healthy enough it's put in on increment but it's very small increments every year and so if you you know you need to have monitoring for those time periods you have to monitor at least until the regen's away um but ideally you never want the, the impacts to get up to very high levels again um moving on to a question from alistair um if you had to make a recommendation for a solution to the big picture issues what would it be um i i think yeah i mean again it comes it come so the reason why i'm kind of heavily focusing on the herbivore impacts here is because they are the most pervasive thing uh, the most pervasive threat or impact on our pine woods at the moment um uh or like I mean, climate change is a, is, a, is a thing everywhere, but herbivore impacts is um, the magnitude, sorry, times the kind of level of exposure to higher, very high impacts is makes it the greatest threat in my view. And it, it impacts all of the separate characteristics of health and resilience. It impacts diversity through blanket over browsing or selective over browsing slash over grazing. It impacts continuity by, you know, preventing regeneration um it impacts uh, mobility because if you can't have regeneration you can't have mobility it impacts connectivity because in the long term um if you can't have free regeneration taking place your your pine woods become isolated little fragments um so yeah herbivore impacts is the main thing that needs to be looked at um i think we need to look at uh, other ways of, of achieving landscape scale herbivore impacts and my personal view on this is that that needs to be done in a more uh involved and just way 
in the landscape rather than um rather than this kind of top down approach of okay we are going to you know bring in contractors to get our deer down to this level or you know um i think there has to be a more kind of there has to be a, a socially better way to do that um like the system in norway where you know you've got more hunters on the ground who are, who are basically working to a system where the the quota is set based on the deer weight or something like that um that's my personal view on it uh, i i think that that all needs to be overhauled basically and people have to be given more of a right to um to hunt like if 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 at the end of the day if uh if if some of the um the pinewood managers are not willing to bring those impacts down to levels they need to be at then whoever actually wants to do that should be allowed to do it uh, and that's that's a personal view um So I've got one from, oh yeah, just wind it up. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, if anyone has uh, any more questions, feel free to drop me a line. It's james at treesforlife.org.uk. Um, and otherwise, um, thanks very much, everyone. And thanks for listening to me going on. And uh, yeah, um, I hope I hope that that was, that was useful in some way. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. I'm just opening everybody's videos again so they can chat and uh, be seen. So I'll, I'll work my way through the names. Right. Well, uh, while you're doing that, Sam, uh, and by the way, thank you very much for keeping all that together. Technically, that was uh, that was really good, particularly when uh, James uh, James's system faded away a little bit there. That's great. Uh, James, that was fantastic. Um, you know, every day is a school day, and I certainly learned something there. And um, uh, a lot of it, you know, I thought was so familiar. But what what I hadn't um, what I hadn't actually realised was how far we've we've gone down the sort of compartment compartmentalisation route. You know, since everybody was a generalist and everything was done generally, there's been an increasing um, uh, progression over the years, I suppose, to become specialised and uh, put things in little boxes and you're certainly reflecting that in the amount of deer fencing that there is and the, the contrast between fenced areas and, and you know, the, the, the sort of um, condition outside the fence is quite stark in places. And I think it always was like that, but um, you know, it's just a, a lot of food for thought to think if, if kind of that's happening everywhere, then that, that's really something for us all to to reflect on but no that was a great presentation and um i think you've got a few good questions there um hope you enjoyed it and uh, we all did so i'd like to say um uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you to everybody for um participating in the agm and um for contributing to to james's talk uh, with questions etc uh, and to all the committee, of course, for putting it all together. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be putting our heads together again after this, I dare say, before too long. So uh, until next time, folks, uh, um, thank you all very much and uh, good night. <laughs>